Everybody has a story. Everybody has a testimony. You can't help it. It's who, it's who you are. It's your life. <clears throat> now, some people treat their story as if it were a resume. You know, all the great things that they've done and uh, all the things that they would like everybody to know about them, and we hide the rest of it. But the totality of who we are is what we need to share with everybody else. We all have a story. And for me, <clears throat> my story was not just written by me. I've got a ghostwriter. Y'all know those people who write books and novels and they, they have a ghostwriter? Mine's just called the Holy Ghost, right? He comes along and he helps me write my story. But everybody's story takes on their own DNA, just the way God gave it to you. Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the plans that I have for you. God has plans for you in your life. Plans for good, I like that part, and not for evil. To give you what? A future and a hope. So we know that God works in our life, but we also know that there are some difficult things that we go through. There's some hard things. And people always ask, why? I don't understand why. My brother that's eight years older than I am found the girl of his dreams. She was... I think 21, 22, I can't remember. That's been a year or two since then. But they were in a car wreck and her neck was broken. They'd only been married three months. And you ask the question, why? She was so beautiful. She was so nice. I tell everybody she was just a southern peach. She was just so great. And they only had three months together. But I praise God that they had three months together. And my brother's life has been shaped by that. And her testimony has been shaped by that. That was in 1979, and people in Dalton, where I grew up, are still telling this story. I don't know why we go through what we go through. I don't understand, and I don't really have to understand, as long as God does. As long as God can take the things of life and shape a testimony of, of how Great things can be done in people like us. To come to God, you don't have to clean up first. You just have to let him clean up. You just have to come as you are because by his grace, that's how he accepts us, just as we are. And I don't have to perform so that he'll love me. He'll make out of me whatever he so chooses to make out of me. A hair lit preacher, what else can you be, Right? That's all God had for me, and I praise God that he did this. Now, today we're going to look at a man by the name of Legion. That's actually not his name. We don't know his name. That's what he had become known by as Legion. He was demon-possessed. We don't talk much about that in our society today. You know, that they want to cover all that up, but it was true then and it's true now. Demons had started to control his life. He had brokenness, he had lostness, but he came to Jesus as a man who actually had a beginning. Verse 19 said that he had friends, so he had family and he had friends. Now, Proverbs tells us that a man who has friends must himself be friendly. So that tells us that this person that we know today as Legion was a friendly person at one time. He got along with people. He knew people. He encouraged people. He was encouraged by others. He just had a lot in life. Now, as much as God loves you, Satan hates you. As, long, as much as God wants to bless you and to use you for his honor and glory, Satan wants to derail that. Now, this guy who had friends and had dreams and had hopes and had aspirations, he took a side turn in his life. How many of you know somebody when they were young ventured out? Don't point. Got into some mischief. Amen? Made some wrong choices. Anybody make wrong choices? Allowed things that they probably never wanted to come into their life. You see, as Christians, we're supposed to be followers of Christ. Where he leads us, we will follow. But sometimes we can make choices to follow sin. 
And understand this, that Satan invites you to follow sin. How many of you know that sin will take you down a road that you never thought that you would go? How many of you know that there are things that you thought, well, I'll just try this, and then the next thing you know, they had an influence in your life. That's what sin does. Sin is never stagnant. It'll take you this step, then the next step, and the next step. And then one day you'll say, how in the world did I get here? How did I, I don't understand how one choice could lead to 10 choices, which could lead to 110 choices. And we talk about addiction, but folks, we all have addictions. We all have things that come into our life and begin to take control. Hebrews 12, 2 says that we are supposed to repent of the sin, this is old King James now, that so easily besets you, ensnare you is what the new King James says. Do you know that there are things that you can let into your life and the next thing you know, they've taken hold of you? If you open up a door to something, Satan will kick it wide open. You'll, you'll take one step and you might step into this thing called quicksand. Now, I'm told, never been in quicksand. But I'm told the harder you fight to get out, the more you get entrenched in. Anybody ever felt that way? Maybe a teenager goes to a party and somebody offers them something. Maybe there are urges and desires that will take us into the next step. Maybe we'll just say, well, I don't know. I'll just try it. You know, Nancy, how many of y'all remember Nancy Reagan? She said about drugs and alcohol, she says, well, just say no. That's a little naive. Because you might say no, but once you open that door, you never know where it's going to lead you. Most likely, this person who had friends, who had family, who had hopes, who had dreams, made some wrong choices, and Satan kind of snuck in. I said that to say this. We need to quit looking down on people. We need to quit judging people. We need to love people. We must be patient. We need understanding. We don't need to look at them and say, why in the world did you? We need to look at them as Christ does and say, now that you have, there's hope. You don't have to stay there. The power of God can change. Well, this is what happens. This, there, there are all kinds of things that we can say about that, more than I have time to talk about. But let me just tell you, there are neural pathways that our brain has. They follow a pattern. It's where it's neurons in your brain that set up kind of like a road in your life. How many of you brushed your teeth this morning? Say amen. amen. I didn't want you to raise your hands because some of you would have to go, should I lie in church? <clears throat> How many of you tied your shoes? How many of you had to think about that? How many of you, when you got in your car and, and drove, you had to say, okay, I need to pay attention so that I can, I, I, can get, I can stay out of the ditch? No, there are neural pathways in our life that create easy paths. Now listen, once those neural pathways are developed, that's the road that you will normally follow. You have to intentionally move to something else. Satan knows that. He can influence. That's the only power that Satan has, is a power to influence. I've always said, if you put up a for rent sign in your life, Satan will buy up all the space you allow him. So let's look at this man who now is possessed, controlled, come on now, out of control. Out of control. In chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Then they came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gadarenes. And when they had come out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs, a man with an unclean spirit. Out of the tombs. He grew up in a home. He had friends. Now he's living with the dead. How many of the ladies, let me talk to y'all for a second. How many do you think that's disgusting? 
wonder about the smell. You see, what happens in society is when someone's different, when someone is out of control, we isolate them. That's why we put them in jail. We don't want to be around them, so we isolate ourselves from them. And they tried to do that to this man. Look what it says in verse 3. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound and shackled and chain, in shackles and chains, and the chains had been pulled apart by him, the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. They wanted to reform this guy. They wanted to put him in jail. They wanted to bind him up. They wanted to say, you're a troubled person. We want you out of society. But when Satan is in control, you all the power of hell goes with him. You ever found yourself wanting to stay away from those kind of people? You ever been in a grocery store and saw someone that you thought might be like that? They look that way, they may smell that way, they may act a certain way, and you'll just go down another aisle. You may go up to the front of the store and say, that person back there is causing problems. Can I just stop here and just say, we know the people. We know the people. Now, y'all clean up pretty good. Y'all smiling. How many of you are in your right mind? Well, after a boat ride that they will never forget, they come up and they see this guy. And you know the first thing that they probably did? They probably went, ugh. They probably cringed. But you know, there's something else. I think Jesus smiled. Because when this man came, he ran and he fell on his face before him. And the Bible says to, to bow down is the word worship. That's a cool thing. That's a cool thing. Now, I don't know who brought themselves to fall down, the demons within him, but when this man found himself bowing down before Christ, the demon spoke. The demon spoke. Look what it says in verse 6. When he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped him, and he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? The demons, fallen angels, followed Lucifer, Satan. They said, I can be like God. I don't want to follow God's rules. I don't want to follow God's ways. And they chose to go a different way. They said it was their freedom. Well, now they're having to live with their choices. Now they're having to live with the consequences of their choices. They knew who Jesus was. So it says here, I implore you by God that you do not torment me. Sin torments. And what they were afraid of was the next step. Now, demons are bound for, here's the word, hell. Hell was created for Satan and his angels. As a matter of fact, if you so choose to not follow Christ, if you so choose to follow your own way, if you don't want to receive him, if you want to reject Jesus, you can do that, but there are consequences with that too. And if you die without knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and Lord, you will not go into heaven. You will not go into the place where everything is good, everything is holy, everything is peaceful, everything is loving. You'll get the opposite. Because God is love. And if you choose not to live in the land of where God is love and God is ruler and God is master, that's your choice. But you'll go to a place that is the opposite of. Now, these demons understood that where they were, go there was no hope for them. There was no salvation for them. And it says to us that Satan himself will be taken and chained and thrown into the abyss, the bottomless pit. And there he will be held until he is judged and thrown into what the Bible calls the lake of fire. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I don't care how bad they are. You find the worst person in the worst jail, and I would not want that person to have no hope or love ever again. I am a picture of the love of God. 
I am not perfect. Thank you for not saying amen. I have flaws. I have things I battle. I have this sin that does so easily ensnare me too. But I've been forgiven. I've become a child of the King. My name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And when I breathe my last breath here, I breathe my first breath there. I'm going home. I'm going to heaven. But not everybody has that. Not everybody has that. So look what it says here. It says in verse 8, Jesus said to him, Come out of the man, unclean spirit. And they had to come out. You can't say no to Jesus. When Jesus has a command, you got to follow. Now, Jesus asked him his name. What is your name? What is your name? Now, did Jesus not know his name? It was just a confession. Who are you? Okay. When nobody else is around, who are you, Ronnie? Who are you? Johnny, who are you? I mean, other people may have a view of you, but the Holy God in heaven, he'll ask you this question, who are you? You can fool me, but you can't fool God. So he asked this man, he wants to hear the confession. Who are you? And he says, <clears throat> he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country, not send him to the place of the abyss where he'll be hailed for judgment. Give me hope. Verse 11, another choice. A large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountain. So all the demons begged him saying, send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out entered the swine, there was about 2,000, and the herd, <laughs> I love this, they ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. There are things that we allow into our lives that pig would not, pigs would not take. When the demons went into the pigs, they said, no, 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 no. Can I tell you the, the most corny joke I know? They went and they committed suicide. I told you it was bad. I know. Cheryl's over there waiting. I know. I know. The Jews hated pigs. They called them unclean. But even an unclean pig would not tolerate Satan's influence in their life that we do. We call it a shortcoming. We call it a a habit. We call it a just a, an ordinary part of life. We would never want to have to confess those things to God. We want to cover them up. Well, somebody was watching. Look in verse 14. So those who fed the swine, and they towed it in the city and then the country. This is the, the country of the Decapolis. The and they went out to see what it was that had happened. So the people that are keeping the swine, they go home and say, our pigs are gone. 2,000 gone. Well, I say 2,000. I'm not sure how many there were. There were at least 2,000 demons that were there. Well, it says they went out to see what had happened. They're going out to, to discover. They're going out to investigate a little bit. And, and they came to Jesus, verse 15, and saw the one, they knew him now. They knew him. They didn't like him, but they knew him. They saw the one who had been demon-possessed and had the legion sitting, not running around like a wild man, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. Don't tell me what God can't do. He can take the one with the worst troubles and make them whole again i love it 
They just came out of the boat where Jesus said those words to the wind. Peace, be still. There's peace when Jesus comes in. I wonder how Legion felt around Jesus and the disciples. I think he felt at home. I think for the first time in a long time, he felt like he was valued. I think he felt like he belonged. And they saw him, the one that they wanted to isolate, they wanted to stay away from. And they saw that he's looking pretty good. Somebody gave him some clothes to wear. And he's sitting and he's calm and he's peaceful. And he's in his right mind. I wonder if he looked up at him and said, hey, y'all remember me? I know I was the one who used to run up and down the streets and chase the kids. I, I, but, but look at me now. Everybody has a testimony. Everybody has a testimony. What is a testimony? Who you were before you met Christ? How you met Christ? And what your life's been like since then? That's our story. How many of y'all have a testimony? Yeah, we all do. What were you things that, when you got saved, that used to convict your soul? That you knew weren't right and you knew that God wanted to take something and make something and give you peace and love and joy out of? What, what were those things, what was your life like before Christ? Then simply... How you met Christ. I have a story. I tell it often. I felt like my chest was going to explode. I felt like that, that drawing of God that I knew that I needed to repent. I was scared. I was asking questions. And praise God, my, my dad had patience with me that day. And he told me the story of Jesus and he told me that Life would be good. And I gave my heart and life to Christ. By the way, I found out that a lot of people say, well, I want Jesus to be my Savior. And they're missing out because Savior's good. But I want Him to be my Lord. I want Him to rule. I want to have one ruler in my life, and it's not Lynn. I want it to be Christ. When my Lord says, Brian, my answer better be yes, sir. Yes, sir. Brian, would you? Yes, sir. Wherever you lead, I will follow. What a joy to be with Christ wherever he takes me. What your life was like, how you got saved, what it's been like since then. Y'all share some of the goodness of God. That was a great song, Mark. I appreciate you singing that song. I'm grateful for all the things God's done for me. Well, Legion was grateful too. Look what it says in verse 18. When they got into the boat, he who had been demon-possessed begged him that he might be with him. I wouldn't want to leave Jesus either. I mean, he's getting in the boat to leave, and he's like, no, 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 don't leave me. Can I come? Can I come? Verse 19, however, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had compassion on you. That's a testimony. That's a testimony. Go to your circle of friends. Go to your place of influence. And just tell them the wondrous story of Jesus. Now, I don't think Legion had to tell him who he used to be. They knew him. But he comes cleaned up. And they're saying, what happened to you? Glad you asked. Let me tell you what God's done for me. I met a man by the name of Jesus, and he set me free. 
I've never felt this good. No longer am I burdened. No longer do I feel dirty. No longer do I have to hide anything. How wonderful Christ has been for me. Why did Jesus send them there? They were his congregation. And they, you cannot deny a testimony. You don't have the right to come to me and say, Preacher Brian, that's not right. Because you didn't live it. But I have. See, I was mischievous and I was cunning. I felt like I could talk myself out of any situation. God gave me this great big mouth. You ever talked yourself out of trouble? I got pretty good at it. So you know what God did? God put me in a place where I couldn't talk myself out of it. It's called rock bottom. It's between a rock and a hard place. And because he loved me, he let me find myself there. Oh, what God could do. Then I had the great privilege of going talking to my friends that I grew up with, played ball with, hung out with, went to school with, got into mischief with. I remember when I, I was a financial planner, and uh, at 24 years of age, I, I surrendered to the ministry. And I knew that there was one thing. I had to tell the story. And they said, I thought you had it going pretty good. Didn't you have your office set up? I'm like, yeah, but I've got a, I got a new life. I got a new goal. I got a new dream. It's been a few years since then. Well, I'm going to follow that permission. And I want the Lord to follow me. Let's get verse 20. And he departed and went to, the, to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him. Tell the story. People need to hear the story. That's your mission. People need the Lord. Why don't we tell our story? Maybe it's been a while and maybe we don't value what God has done for us as much as we used to. Maybe we've gotten comfortable. Maybe we've lost our boldness. I've told y'all this story. When I met Lynn, I was going to talk to that girl. I was preaching in church, you know, and when people filed through and they wanted to shake my hand, and Lynn just snuck on by and went out the door, and she didn't even let me shake her hand. But I wanted to talk to her. So you know what I did? I chased her through a parking lot. I interrupted a conversation and I got her number. <laughs> now, 36 years later of marriage, 37 and a half years since I did that, um, I sure am grateful. And I don't, I'm not ashamed to tell you that story. And I'm not ashamed to tell you that the greatest decision I ever made in all my life was letting Christ be Lord of all. Now, most of us are Christians. Amen? Most of us have seen the devastation in this world. Politicians are talking about how they're going to figure it out and how they're going to change everything. How many of you know there's only one change agent? His name is Jesus. You can take one of those pigs and you can clean it up. You can put perfume on it. You can put a bowl around its neck, and you know what it is? A pig. And you may take it home and try to make a pet out of it. Steve and Angie aren't here today, but they have a living pig in their house. Isn't that right, Virgil? God help. The only pig we have in our house is me. But if you turn that pig loose, you know what he's going to find? A mud puddle. Because that is his nature. You know, we live in a broken, sinful world. And we treat, keep trying to reform the world. We keep trying to isolate those people when what they need is Jesus. 
we look pretty good in here. I wish we had some rascals. I wish we had a few scoundrels that need Jesus. How many of your friends do you love enough to tell them the truth, the whole truth, the eternal truth? You see, the door that many sinners are walking through, and Satan wants to kick that door wide open, they're a trap door. If it can happen to Legion, it can happen to your children and your grandchildren and to your neighbors and to your co-workers. But just as bad as sin can take control, Jesus can set them free. We have a commission. We have a privilege. And what Jesus told this man was, we'll spend eternity together, but right now, tell the story of Jesus. Tell the story of Jesus. Are you thankful? It's the season of Thanksgiving. When I opened up my Bible and I said, all right, I'm going through the book of Mark, I'm going through the book of Mark, and I'm taking one story after the next, and I said, it's legion for Thanksgiving. How am I going to get thankfulness out of this? I'm just thankful for what God has done. And I'm thankful that we have another opportunity. And I'm praying for what God's going to do in us.